Please be seated. Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Page 1217. I realize uh, we have a wide generation difference here. So some of you are going to recognize this, some of you aren't, but I want to go to it anyway. How many of you recognize this song? I want it all, I want it all, I want it all, and I want it now. Okay, my wife, of all people. Anybody else? Okay, James says he does. All right, Mary, what's the song? I want it all, by who? By Queen, that's right. Now some of you are going, who's that? Okay, it doesn't matter. The whole song, they repeat the refrain over and over again. I want it all! I want it all! I want it all! And I want it now! I got a question for you. What's it mean to have it all? What's it mean to have it all? Now, don't make the jump that it's strictly and only financial. You know, to some people, having it all has nothing to do with money. To some people, having it all means that I've got time to do whatever I want. Now, of course, for some folks, it means money. It means that, they, that uh, they've got the boat, they've got the uh, vacation home, they've got box seats for their favorite team. They've got designer clothes, they've got a private chef, they've got a personal trainer, they've got a maid. But to some folks, it means no obligations. I can fish all I want, I can sleep all I want, I can golf all I want, I can shop all I want, I can read all I want, I can go pursue my hobby. But whatever to you is having it all, what would happen really if, if you got that? What if you got it all? What if that dream came true? Well, you might end up on the TV show, The Lottery Ruined My Life, or something similar. I don't know if you ever watched that show. It's very interesting to see what people who suddenly have it all financially, what happens to them. Here's the thing about money. It doesn't change character. If you were undisciplined before you got money, you'll be undisciplined afterwards. If you were an unkind person, you'll still be unkind. If you were generous beforehand, you'll be generous afterwards. The money doesn't change the care. So this, this TV show, The Lottery Ruined My Life, doesn't lack for people to feature because there are so many people who win the lottery who weren't very good people to begin with. And they weren't very disciplined people. And winning the lottery simply makes them soft and a lot of them lose their friends and their family. And certainly, if we were to suddenly have it all, what might that do to your spiritual life? Think of it like this. I'm gonna guess we have more than one chocolate lover in here, okay? I, you love chocolate, right? Every, I've never really known anybody that didn't like chocolate. Well, let's just imagine a uh, fudge brownie. Warm, soft, just fresh coming out of the oven. And it's got big chocolate chunks in the brownie. And it's covered with fudge. Good, isn't it? Now, let's imagine you've got that for breakfast and lunch and supper and before you go to bed, and any time you want a snack, and you get, how long would it take for that to not be special anymore? For really you to go, I don't really want, how long would it take before your triglycerides were out of control? Your cholesterol was out of control. Your waistline was out of control. I mean, it's just too much of that. One of the reasons that it's so good is because it's special, right? You hardly ever have that if you like chocolate. Really, you hardly ever have You know it's not good for you. Too much of that is, too much of a good thing is, is too much. I uh, have been through several things 
down through the years to try and you know, control my weight, manage my weight, lose weight. I told you about the big change that happened at Easter with the nutritionist. But there was a time when I thought I discovered the secret. And the secret was cabbage soup. Cabbage soup is supposed to burn calories. It's supposed to have a lot of fiber in it. And you know what? We made a big pot of cabbage soup and I loved it. And my son Aaron still teases me to this day. Dad, do you remember when you said you could eat cabbage soup every day? I don't like cabbage soup anymore. It was too much of something that I liked. What if a church had everything it needed? You know, I know of a church in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, Dewey Avenue Free Methodist Church. One of the dear old saints passed away and left them a million dollars. I don't know if it was life insurance or if they had investments or what, but they left them a million dollars. This church had been struggling. They never had a lot of people, but what they did have was a lot of passion. They had people that were sacrificing to keep their little church open. They were conducting revival services, and they were reaching out to the community because they knew they had to or they wouldn't survive. Well, something strange happened when they got the million dollars. The people in the church said, well, I don't have to give anything anymore. We don't have to try to get new people anymore. We don't have to do anything. We've got a million dollars. Well, several years later, about getting close to 20 years later, the little church on Dewey Avenue in Newcastle, Pennsylvania closed. Do you know why? They got soft. They said, I don't need to do anything anymore. And they became complacent. They had no passion to reach the lost. They were comfortable. Spiritual power was gone. Well, with all this in mind, let's read verses 1 to 6 in Revelation 3. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up! Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they're worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here's one thing about the Christians in Sardis. Unlike some of the other letters that we've gone through here in Revelation, where the churches and the Christians were being persecuted, the Christians in Sardis, the city of Sardis were not being persecuted. They were not having any opposition from the Jews. And the reason is, is they weren't a, a threat to anybody. They were just getting together on Sundays, singing a few songs, saying a few prayers. Somebody would get up and talk to them a little bit out of the word that they had at that time. They had no impact on the community. They weren't influencing the culture. The culture was influencing them. They became complacent and apathetic. They looked alive because, you see, things were happening. When you got the Sunday bulletin, they said, wow, looky, church on Monday night, Bible study on Tuesday night, men's Bible study on Wednesday night, board meeting on Thursday night, church of Bishop Gibbons on Friday, and Bible study on Saturday. All kinds of things were happening. But they'd become complacent. They had a form of godliness, but no power. And in the second verse, Jesus says to them, wake up, you're asleep. You know, I got to thinking, might this apply to the church in the United States? Might this apply to a church like ours? You're sleeping. You're just going through the motions. There's no power. 
You don't have any persecution. The uh, word that's used there, wake up, actually uh, can be interpreted better if you, if you use the word watch. Stay on your guard. And that's a good idea for a church or any Christian, isn't it? Stay on your guard that you don't become complacent, that you don't become too comfortable, that you understand what you're supposed to be doing as Christians and as a church. You know, when, uh, when I was in high school, uh, I didn't ride a school bus. I walked to school. We lived close enough. And no, it wasn't five miles uphill both ways. Um, it was actually about a half a mile. And uh, I did not have an alarm clock to get up in the morning. I had a, a, a unique thing that I think is uh, becoming more and more obsolete. Uh, I had a mother. And she would make sure we got up to go to school. Now, here's an interesting thing. I didn't do this on purpose. I still don't know how it happened. It did. I do remember this. The first step at the bottom of our stairs in the house I grew up in squeaked. So when you stepped on it, okay, somehow I learned to wake up to that squeak. Now, understand, it was up the stairs, around the corner, down the hall, make the left, down the hall, and then the room on the right. And that's where I was. I slept in there with my brother. We shared a room. Well, by the time my mother's foot hit the first step, squeak. I would wake up to that squeak. And when she got upstairs to our room, I was up and uh, ready to go downstairs and, and uh, jump in the shower. Well, the thing is with my brother, you need a bomb to wake him up, okay? He, he's a teacher himself now, and his wife tells me, you still need a bomb to wake him up, okay? Here's what I got to thinking about. What would it, what's it going to take from the Lord to wake us up? I think it depends on what we're listening for. Again, this was not on purpose. It, it was all subconscious. I don't know how this ever happened. Uh, you know, when I set the alarm at home right now, you know how your alarm clock goes click and then beep, 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 beep. beep. I oftentimes wake up to the click before it ever starts, okay? So at home, growing up, I woke up to the squeak. Small, little sound, didn't take much. And I got to thinking, the Lord sometimes talks about His still, small voice. What are we listening for? Are we, as a church and as Christians, so sound asleep that we're like my brother, where it takes a bomb to wake us up? Or are we listening... For just the slightest little thing from God to wake us up so we hear His voice. You know, we live in a country, uh, even in Tonawanda, North Tonawanda, Amherst, Kenmore, Lockport area, wherever you're from. We can have whatever we want 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Good things and bad things. Whatever you want, you can get it. It's a shame, isn't it? That even among Christian people, among churches, that billions upon billions of dollars are spent on entertainment. And yet we have children in our communities who go to school every morning hungry. Who go without the supplies that they need to go to school. And we think that by showing up for church one or two hours a week that we've done our job. I went to church, I'm good, the rest of the week I do what I want to do. You look at the third verse here. He says, Remember what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. If you don't, I'll come like a thief. And you don't know what time I'll come. Remember when you were first saved? Remember when you first heard the gospel? Remember when you first decided, Hey, I believe this. I'm going to change my life. Remember the joy and enthusiasm? Remember when you wanted to tell somebody else? What happened? Kind of got into a routine. You know, William Barclay said this, In the Christian life, there must be a decisive moment when a man decides to be done with the old way and begin the news. Begin the new. Have you made a decision like that? I'm done with the old way of living. I'm going to live a new way. 
I remember coming home from church the morning that, that I accepted Christ as my Savior, telling my family, going to school the next day. And uh, I didn't, a lot of my closest friends, I didn't have to tell them. They saw something different in me. I think what they saw was, number one, the way my language changed. And number two, probably the fact that I was carrying a Bible to school with me and reading it in study hall. That had been out of character for me. But you know, before I got to that moment, there were people saying to me, Don, we're praying for you. Don, why don't you become a Christian? Don, why aren't you saved? Um, and it wasn't just the people that I knew. I remember standing at my locker one morning and this uh, girl, a couple, couple lockers down, um, I come to find out her name was Liz. They called her Bird because she looked like one. I'm there getting the stuff in my locker one morning, and this girl with the dark hair, skinny, looked like a bird, she looks over at me and she says, Don, I'm praying for you. And I looked at her and I said, Don't! <gasps> and who are you? Well, my name is Liz. I know Raylene. Raylene told me to pray for you. I said, well, don't bother. But you know what? I'm glad she did. Age 15, September 1971, I committed my life to Christ. You look at the fourth verse here real quick. It says, you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. You know, one of the things, uh, even among the, the uh, idols that they worship, you couldn't go into the temple if you, if you were wearing dirty clothes. You could lose your citizenship. You got thrown out. Okay? Well, he's speaking in a spiritual sense with Christ. There are people who haven't soiled their life with sin and immorality. And he says the ones that have been faithful, you don't have soiled garments. You haven't been influenced by the culture. You aren't into idol worship and immorality and adultery. So you are citizens of God's kingdom. And if you are doing those things, then you're not citizens. The white garments mentioned in verse 5, uh, you might be interested, those of you who like history, in knowing that the Romans, whenever they would have a, a military victory, they would parade over their enemy uh, wearing white clothes. And the city would literally become called the city, of, city in white. So a second promise is given here that, we are, that God says, I'm not going to erase your name. Back then, in those ancient civilizations, a king would keep a register of all the citizens. And if you died, they erased your name. If you committed a crime, they erased your name. Well, Christians at that time were considered, in many cases, disloyal to the state. If you were faithful to Jesus, you weren't faithful to Caesar. Okay? But Jesus is saying, if you're faithful to me, be faithful to me, and I will not erase your name out of God's list of citizens of His kingdom. And there's a big word there. It's only two letters long, and that word is if. If you confess His name, Jesus will claim you as His own. But if you don't, judgment is at hand. Be faithful. 